Um, all right. Um, here we are. We're like right here. <laughs> Deuteronomy 16 and 17. We're in the thick of uh, Moses preaching through the, the terms of the covenant um, framed by the covenant ser sermons and so on, that this is how Israel, the people of Israel, by uh, adhering to the terms of the covenant, are choosing life uh, by uh, choosing faithfulness to the covenant. And so that get, gets embodied in a lot of different ways. Um, if you look at Deuteronomy 16, that's where, we're, that's where we're starting today. This will be now the fourth, the fourth time that we have uh, worked through <laughs> the three main festivals, Jewish festivals. Do you, so the great thing about, I don't know, uh, this translation, this is the New International Version, but I like it when um, translations, if there's any parallel, like what are other biblical passages that cover this exact topic and like cross-references or parallels? So that's what's going on up here. So Passover, how many passages in the Torah are there that talk about and explain the Passover? Well, there's Exodus 12. That's the actual story in the Exodus. There's Leviticus 23. Let's just hit it again. Numbers 28, why not again? Deuteronomy 16, one last time. <laughs> That's kind of what's going on right here. Um, so let's, uh, but there is, there is each, each time you go through it, it's for a different purpose and a different literary context. And uh, the way that the three main feasts are set out here is all about uh, relating. These are about all about rhythms of time, sacred time, that tell the story of who God is. But this is, all, well, you'll just see why it's cool. So let's just go for it. Deuteronomy 16. <laughs> Observe the month of Aviv and celebrate the Passover of Yahweh your God. Because in the month of Aviv, he brought you out of Egypt by night. Sacrifice the Passover, i.e. the Passover lamb, to Yahweh your God, an animal from your flock or herd, at the place Yahweh will choose as a dwelling for his name. So, so remember, we're, they have been celebrating Passover um, for their years in the, in the desert, but the whole um, framework of Deuteronomy, of course, is that we're not in the land, but we're looking forward um, to the land here. So this has been a big thing at the place Yahweh your God will choose is a big theme in these laws because we're setting up what their life is, is uh, going to be like. So this is going to be a centralized. So you've been doing it in the wilderness, and as you travel around, you just celebrate Passover wherever you go. That's not going to be the case once you get into the land. There's going to be one centralized temple where everybody's going to come to to celebrate this great feast. Let's keep reading. Verse 3. Do not eat it with bread made with yeast, but for seven days eat unleavened bread, the bread of affliction, because you left Egypt in haste, so that all the days of your life you may remember the time of your departure from Egypt. Let no yeast be found in your possession in all your land for seven days. Don't let any of the meat you sacrifice on the evening of the first day remain until morning. So, uh, remember the yeast. Remember the yeast thing. Don't eat yeast that week. So. That whole thing um, is about haste. Do you see that? That was the, the connection in verse 3. Don't have any yeast because you left Egypt in haste. Remember that whole reasoning. So this is a, it's a, it's a symbol, but the whole thing was they had to be ready to go at any moment. Do you have time to like let your bread sit overnight or a whole day and let it rise with the yeast and so on? No, you don't have time. you got to leave Egypt like that the moment that Yahweh sets things in motion. So this is, this is all that's symbolic. These are symbols that are remind you of the story. And so no yeast in the bread. You just have flatbread for a week because flatbread you can make really quickly. That's the idea. And also, like, don't let any of the meat be left over. You need to eat it 
and be ready to go at any moment. <clears throat> Verse 5. You must not sacrifice the Passover in any town Yahweh your God gives you, except the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. There you must sacrifice the Passover in the evening when the sun goes down on the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. Roast it and eat it at the place Yahweh your God will choose. Then in the morning, return to your tent for six days, eat unleavened bread. On the seventh day, hold an assembly to Yahweh your God and do no work. So the unique thing in this passage about the Passover is it's focusing, as all of Deuteronomy is, on their future life. And so you're going into the land, and so uh, everybody's going to have to flock to the central place, wherever that's going to be when, when you get into the land. So notice um, Passover here. Here, we'll put it this way. So you celebrate, these are the three feasts. And these are s still the main classic feasts um, in Judaism, though there's been a whole bunch added along the way. But Passover is like the crown, crown jewel. What time of year are we talking here? Spring, it, it coincides with Easter, or rather Easter, Resurrection Sunday. <laughs> always coincides with, uh, with Passover. So it's, uh, it's always in early spring. But notice that it has, what, what is the meaning of Passover? You're going to celebrate it in the land, but it all is about uh, pointing you back to the foundation story of the Exodus. So um, this is, I don't know, <laughs> I feel like we've had this talk four times on the Wednesday mornings. But it's about building patterns in your life. In this case, a huge party uh, with lots of food. Um, but it's food that's symbolically chosen that reminds you of the story, of the foundation story of what God has done in his faithfulness. So that's Passover in the early spring. It points you backwards to the event of the Exodus. What's the next feast? Verse 9. Count off seven weeks. How many days is that? Seven times seven. So early for multiplication. <laughs> All right, so 49 days. Count off 49 days, and then on the 50th day, do what? Count off seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. Then celebrate the Feast of Weeks to Yahweh your God by giving a free will offering in proportion to the blessings Yahweh your God has given you. And, and then rejoice, which means have a party, before Yahweh your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for your name. You, your sons, your daughters, your male servants, your female servants, the Levites in your towns, the immigrants, the fatherless, orphans, and the widows living among you. Remember, you were slaves in Egypt, so carefully follow these decrees. So the, the seven weeks is um, actually counting seven um, weeks after Passover. Um, so this is, here it's called the Feast of, of Weeks because it's 49 days and on the 50th have this party. So Passover um, and unleavened bread also coincides with the beginning of uh, the wheat harvest, at least in ancient Israel's calendar. Um, I don't think it does anymore. Um, <laughs> this is the 21st century. We can get wheat out of the earth all year round, can't we? But not back then. So, so it was seven, uh, seven weeks. Um, and in uh, later tradition, this feast was not called the Feast of Weeks, but the Feast of... Oh, yes. For, actually, it goes by about three or four different names. So there's the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of First Fruits, and then in Christian tradition, it's called Pentecost. And Pentecost is just the Greek word for, uh, for uh, 50, <laughs> which is how many days. It's that seven sevens, 49 days, and then on the 50th day, start this feast. Um, so this is exactly what... Uh, is going on in the book of Acts, right? So there's 
there was Passover weekend, Jesus was executed, then uh, the resurrection, and then there's uh, the 40 days that he's with them, and then they're waiting and praying, and then on Pentecost is when uh, the events of Acts 2 go down. So even, so in, in Christian tradition, it's interesting, Passover uh, is celebrated by Christians as connected to Good Friday and Easter, and then Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, is also celebrated in the Christian calendar uh, to look back to the gift of the Spirit. Now, so just look at this, this description of it right here. So you're counting off seven weeks, and what are you doing? You're seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. So what have you been doing for these seven weeks? You've been harvesting, right? right? So you began to put the sickle to the standing grain, and for seven weeks you've been working on it. Then the Feast of Weeks, you bring a free will offering, just a thank you offering to God. Why and for what? Well, in proportion to the blessing Yahweh your God has given you. So notice it's not, this is not necessarily like a certain number. It's not even a tithe. It's just whatever God has hooked you up with in this harvest, bring a free will offering in proportion to whatever God's given you. And then what are you doing with all of this? This is kind of like the annual tithe party. So many parties in Judaism, I'm telling you. So what do you do? You, first of all, you go, everybody comes to uh, the main central place, and then you invite family, and then you invite all of the poor people that you're connected to, right? Or, the, or at least, so, so orphans and widows, um, which were most typically poor, Immigrants, they might have a good day job, but they're not uh, landed, it's not their homeland, so you make sure they're taken care of, the Levites and so on, and you just have a big Pentecost party. There you go. Now, n notice all of this in the context then, um, and you're remembering that you're slaves in Egypt. So if, the, if Passover is, is pointing back to the Exodus, Pentecost, at least at this moment, where are they right now? Are they in the land right now? Israel and Moses, are they in the land right now? They're not. They're about to go in. So at least in this context, um, this feast is all about pointing forward. So you look back to the Exodus, and then in this moment, you're looking forward to uh, the good land that God's going to give you and the blessings and, and so on. Okay. Third feast. Celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Any other translations? Booths. Booths. What are, what, are, what are booths in modern English now? Booths. They're at conferences and state fairs and restaurants. There you go. That's English booth. Isn't that right? Can you think of any other setting used booth? Just <laughs> that's good. So that's interesting. Yes, so... And I guess like the county fair conference booth is sometimes a little tent, maybe. Maybe it's a tent. More likely a little metal stand with the tacky curtains and then your logo of your company or something. Anyway, so uh, booths, we're talking about little tent. We're talking about tents here, an actual tent, camping tent. So celebrate the Feast of Tents. I think in modern English that would get it, get it for us. For seven days, after you've gathered the produce of your threshing floor and of your wine press. Um, so we've got, uh, we'll just call this tents, the Feast of Tents. Um, and this is always in uh, mid-fall. Uh, it's in uh, October, uh, according to our calendar. So be, be joyful at your feast. You, your sons, daughters, male servants female servants, Levites, immigrants, fatherless, widows who live in your towns. For seven days, celebrate the feast to Yahweh your God at the place Yahweh will choose. For Yahweh your God will bless you in all of your harvest and in all the work of your hands, and your joy will be complete. Oh, that's interesting. Your joy will be complete. Come on, anybody. 
what's going on? I've never followed that up before. You guys know? That's a key phrase in 1 John. We write this to make our joy complete. And then he, um, this is a line used all throughout 1 John. Ooh, that's interesting. Hmm, what do you think is going on there? I'm going to all follow it up this morning and let you know. That's interesting. So John's adopting a phrase from Deuteronomy about the Feast of Tabernacles. Anyway, that is interesting. It's Bible, I'm telling you. So uh, here in this, in this feast, um, there's always midfall. And this, so if Passover, we're looking back to the Exodus. If Pentecost is all about, for right now, Israel, they're not in the land, but they're looking forward to being in the land and the blessing that comes from it. And then where is Israel still right now as Moses is preaching to them? They're in the plains of Moab, still journeying through the wilderness on the way. And so, um, if anything, this feast, at least in Deuteronomy 16, is all about the, the in-between time. Isn't that interesting how these three feasts... In, now, this is just Deuteronomy 16. Um, at the other passages that talk about the feasts, there's different context and so on. But right here at this moment, where Israel stands with Moses back to the exodus, forward to the land, and then in between. So you have feasts that cover your identity shaped in the past, your hope for the future, and then how you live in the in-between. And, and so Tabernacles is all about reminding you of God's faithfulness as you, you know, were temporary residents and wanderers through the desert uh, and so on. And then this gets celebrated uh, traditionally in Judaism nowadays as you camp in your backyard or your front yard or you eat dinner, you at least eat dinner and have your family meals in a tent somehow in whatever yard you have. Actually in, Mon in Jerusalem today they don't, a lot of people don't have yards because it's a pretty dense city and so a lot of people um, they have a lot of flat roofed houses and so they put up a tent on top of the, on the roof of their house and then they go up there and eat dinner and sleep up there and the kids love it and that's awesome so anyhow but the, so the idea is reminding you of your identity as wanderers and how god god provided for you anyway i just thought it was really cool how the feasts here all have this back forward in between verse 16 three times a year all your men must appear before Yahweh, your God, at the place he will choose. At the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's Passover, at the Feast of Weeks, it's Pentecost, and at the Feast of Tabernacles. No one should appear before Yahweh empty-handed. These are all about uh, celebrating Yahweh's grace, so bringing an offering of thanks. Each one of you bring a gift in proportion to the way Yahweh, your God, has blessed you. So these aren't the only feasts, but these are the three main ones where everybody would gather, um, gather in Jerusalem. Um, you know, before, I mean, I suppose, uh, the, the year that we got to live in Jerusalem uh, as a part of my schooling, that was a really epic experience because, I mean, they don't care about the Christian calendar there, you know what I mean? So like there's no Christmas, no Christmas lights anywhere. There's Hanukkah lights, but it's on a different timing. Um, uh, but it was just, the calendar is just so totally different. But actually, to think about what this practice was like in, uh, in ancient Judaism, there's one author um, that I'll tell you about who helped me capture this. Do you guys know about Anne Rice? She wrote um, one of the most original uh, vampire books. Come on. Anne Rice, Anybody? a loud truck. Uh, the Vampire Chronicles? No, that's quite new. In fact, that one's not even out. What's her most famous book? Interview with a Vampire. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, Anne Rice, 1991. So actually, I don't know that much about her, except she wrote these kinds of books. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, but uh, then she had a, a pretty significant um, conversion to Christianity. And uh, she's a, a really, as it, there, there she is, Anne Rice. As it turns out, she's a really, a really thorough historian and does like first class historical research for all of her novels. And so, 
Um, she ended up writing a, uh, a trilogy that's not complete yet, so only the first two, but about um, the life of Jesus. And they are so good. I, I, I mean, they're novels, but they're awesome. <laughs> they're awesome novels. So I think Christ the Lord, yeah, Christ the Lord, this is the first one, um, and it's, it's probably the most vivid, realistic depiction of what it was like to be a young Jewish person who lived in the sticks like Nazareth and journeying to Jerusalem for the pilgrimage feast. And her, her whole narrative about Jesus' family going to Jerusalem for Passover and what that was like is just so vivid. It's all quite historically accurate, and it's just amazing. And it's probably the most imaginative I've ever been able to place myself in what it would be like to have these rhythms be part of your family life and to be a little kid and so on. You guys, has anybody read Christ the Lord? It's, I mean, you'll read it in three days. It's, a, it's just a candy, <laughs> but it's so good. And then she has uh, Christ the Lord, The Road to Cana, which she takes a little more imaginative license about um, starting with Jesus' baptism and then uh, the whole story there and Mary Magdalene, she kind of weaves in a whole subplot with Mary Magdalene that's not there in the Gospels, but it's really interesting, and there you go, for your enjoyment. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the feast. Those are the feasts. Let's keep going. Deuteronomy 16, verse 18. Oh, yeah, and actually here, 16, 18, so if we had, um, we'll just draw this up here because I think it'll be helpful. So you had, um, in the first part of 16, you had the three feasts. And then in this section here, you have, um, we'll call this 16A. And then you get 16B. Can you, you can't even read that, can you? I'm so sorry. What am I, what am I thinking? So here we go. 16, 18 through chapter 18. So the rest of 16, all of 17, all of 18 is all about uh, Israel's leaders, and specifically four, um, four types of leaders. So look in verse uh, 18. If you have a little heading, who are the leaders being addressed right here? All right, so justice, but specifically look at verse 18. Who are you appointing and what are you setting up here? Judges. Oh, you said judges, and I heard justice. Sorry. Um, go to, uh, let's see, 17, 2, no, excuse me, 17, 8. If cases come before your courts that are too difficult for you all to judge, take them to the place Yahweh your God will choose. Look at verse 9. Who are you supposed to go to there? Priests. Go down to um, verse 16. Who are we talking about here? And then go to chapter 18, right at the beginning. Um, oh, ex oh, excuse me. Go down to verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 15. Yahweh your God will raise up for you a prophet. So, there you go. In these uh, chapters here, we're addressing uh, Israel's four kind of types of leaders. That's what organizes this, uh, this whole section. So, you know, there are times when our chapter numbers and where they are placed don't really help us, you know, and somebody wasn't quite paying attention to the content when they put them in, and this is one of those times. So chapter 17, I think, should actually begin at 16, verse 18. Um, this stuff is so interesting. Let's just go for it. 16, 18. So appoint judges and officials for each of your tribes in every town Yahweh your God has given you. And they shall judge people fairly, is what uh, the New International Version has. This is 1618. They'll judge people fairly. Any other translations? 
here? With righteous judgment. Yeah, yeah. So... Fairly, <laughs> that's, uh, that's the NIV. And then we've got righteous judgment. That sounds so much more intense. And what translation is that? Ah, the Holman Christian Bible, yeah. Any other translations? Just, with a just judgment? Mm-hmm, yeah. Is that the New American Standard? Ah, New King James, yes. So here we are. This, this is, once again, English trying to struggle with biblical culture's way of, of thinking about these things. So we've talked about these two words uh, before. There's uh, the Hebrew word uh, tzedek, um, which at its core means right relationships. It's uh, the basic standard for ethics in, in the Bible. So right relationships is a vision that every person, regardless of your role or status in the community, that there's a right, equitable, healthy relationship, that there isn't abuse of status or inequality. It doesn't mean everybody has the same role, but it does mean that everybody has right relationships and nobody abuses their status to gain power over the other and so on. The second word, uh, is this word mishpat. And these are, uh, how do you say it? D these are decisions or actions designed to create or restore tzedek. So mishpat is what judges do. So mishpat, we would, might call it a ruling, right? Um, what do we call decisions that judges make? Decisions, <laughs> right? Decisions or rulings, um, laws. They enact laws. No, judges enforce and interpret laws. Anyway, you guys get the idea. So I suppose uh, Congress makes laws. Anyway, so you get the idea. So tzedek is the standard and the ideal, and then mishpat or judging are things uh, that you do. So here's the phrase, um, the phrase that this is what judges are supposed to do. Appoint judges, people, uh, and the word is connected to this one, people who do this. Appoint people who will bring about mishpat in each of your tribes, and they shall judge your people with a, and then this is the phrase in Hebrew, with a mishpat, Tzedek. That's the phrase. And th that gets translated as fairly. Or it gets translated as a mishpat that is, quali that's that is um, a mishpat whose quality is described by tzedek. It's a tzedek mishpat. <laughs> right? So it's a decision or a, a ruling that totally and utterly conforms to tzedek in creating right relationships. And that's what judges are supposed to do. It's a mishpat tzedek. So righteous, I think when you hear righteous judgment, you think of like judgment, rah, and it's righteous judgment. So, so again, don't, so it, a judgment is just a just decision that is trying to restore the world or a relationship so that it's equitable and right. That's the idea. So here we go. Do not pervert mishpat. Don't show partiality. Don't accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. That sounds like a proverb, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, you get the idea. Here, in any system of judgment, a community trying to organize itself, you'll have people who want to bend the standards of tzedek so that it will benefit some and not others, yet don't do that. Verse 20, follow, <laughs> follow tzedek and tzedek alone. Only tzedek, that's the highest 
standard because that flows right out, right out of God's own being and the, the divine sacred value of human life and relationships and so on. Setek and setek alone. So that y'all may live in the land and possess the land Yahweh your God is giving you. So let's, uh, let's bring this down to a test case here about how this is supposed to work out. Don't set up any wooden Asherah pole besides the altar you build to Yahweh your God. Remember, Asherah is a, a Canaanite uh, goddess. So a pole would be an idol statue dedicated to her. So don't have Asherah and Yahweh. Don't erect a sacred stone, for these Yahweh your God hates. Don't sacrifice to Yahweh your God an ox or a sheep that has any defect or flaw in it that would be detestable to him. So in this context about sacrificing and potentially to other gods, let's run a test case of Tzedek and Tzedek alone. Let's say there's a man or woman living among you in one of your towns that Yahweh gives you and is found doing evil in the eyes of Yahweh your God in violation of the covenant. And contrary to my command, has worshipped other gods, bowing down to them, to the sun or the moon or the stars, and this gets brought to your attention. So there could be a hundred different ways that somebody's doing this and they have a little shrine in their house or in their backyard or something and nobody knows about it. But the point is that at some point this becomes a public matter and then the question is, oh, we're like the tribe and the people of Yahweh and then now we have this family or person who's publicly like endorsing the worship of other gods and wanting to... Uh, make people think that that's just fine. That's the idea. Then just kill them. Is that, is that Sedek? To just like rage into your neighbor's yard, right? And kill the infidel, something like that. No, no. You must first investigate it thoroughly. If it's true, and if it's been proven that this detestable thing has been done in Israel, then take the man or woman who's done this evil deed to your city gate and stone that person to death. On the testimony of two or three witnesses, someone shall be put to death. No one shall be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. The hands of the witnesses must be first in putting him to death. Then the hands of all your people, you must purge the evil from among you. Now, uh, I know what you're probably thinking because it's the same thing I'm thinking. You're like, whoa, I thought this was going to have a different outcome. Because <laughs> you're talking about Sedek, right? Because from a Western perspective, we're like, that's not Sedek. You can worship whoever you want. You know, don't kill people who worship other gods. So it, that's exactly right. Like, you should never, never kill somebody who doesn't believe what you do. Because that's because we're not living in ancient Israel in the land un under this covenant. So this is, remember, this is part of the whole thing of. This is a different, this is not timeless truth in terms of go do this. These are the terms of the covenant for ancient Israel living in the land. They're a national ethnic entity. And right at this point in the story, that's the form of God's covenant people. We do not live in a covenant people with that form. Uh, therefore, it's a whole different ballgame. Um, but the whole point here is you can see how a law about apostasy with the death penalty in their setting could get abused in a million different ways. And so the whole point is that you go through a very thorough process of investigation uh, to make sure that uh, this gets enforced with the uh, Sedek and Sedek alone. How you guys doing? You guys with me? So in other words, we may not resonate at all or think that it's just deal with the weirdness of the Old Testament, so that's okay. Just struggle with that, that's fine. Uh, but at least recognize that the ideal being set up here is that this never happens in a way, um, in a way that gets abused. Now, can I show you some cool archaeological ruins? Because, come on, you want to see this stuff. Um, so notice this little process here. Look at verse um, 5. Where, uh, where, where is this whole procedure happening? Where do the judges sit? 
where this whole procedure of witnesses and so on, look at verse 5. Where's all this happening? Take that person who's done this deed to the city gate. To the city gate. Um, now, this is cool. So there is uh, in... Oh, that's not good, is it? It didn't look like that a few minutes ago. We'll just uh, refresh it. Here we go. Oh, oh. Wait, what? Did you see it for a second? <laughs> so weird. What's going on with that? Let's do it this way. Oh, yeah, nice. Okay. Um, up in the far north of Galilee, so this is about a 45-minute drive north of the Sea of Galilee, um, uh, was the ancient city of Tel Dan. It was the northernmost city of Israel. And uh, they've excavated it thoroughly, and it's actually is the largest, most well-preserved ancient Israelite city anywhere. Um, and nobody lives there anymore, so it's out in, you know, in the rural areas, and it's just this gigantic city that they begin to unearth. So this is um, the entrance area. Here, let me, this is the, the reconstructed building right here. So this is just the entry gate to the city. The city was actually way uh, up here, you know, up where the round window is. Like, that's where the city is. But this was the big gate system. And there was a series of gates for protection and so on. So out in front of the city was a large stone pavement out here. And then you go through the doors, the first set of doors, and there was a big inner area, and that's the city gate. And so, that's what you're looking at right here. Here's the big paved area. And so these walls were gigantic right here. And then this was the city gate area right through these first doors. And it's a large open paved area in there. I'll show you a picture. But here's what's interesting. Um, is te at Tel Dan, right in the courtyard, before you go in the first gate, is this little structure right here which is a little, it's about, I don't know, a, a 10 by 10 uh, wall structure. And I'll show you a close-up of it. Yeah, here it is. Um, it's a nicely piled little wall of stones. And then all of these um, similarly shaped stones right here. Um, and these are uh, almost certainly what the Bible is referring to as... Um, uh, the high places, or what are called the, the Bamot. So they're, they're basically ritual shrines to other gods and um, little memorial stones to which deities are being honored as you go into the city and so on. Which deities do you worship in Tel Dan? Will you stop at the Bamot before you go into the city gate and you read, we honor this god, that god, that god. And uh, so there you go. So one of these was also found in front of ancient Israelite Tel Dan. But that shouldn't just surprise you because you know that most Israelites for most of Israel's history actually didn't follow Yahweh anyway. So that's interesting in and of itself. Then you go into the actual gate area here and what you find um, in the gate area is this really cool old stepped platform with um, all these ancient pedestal bases. And this is the city gate. And so um, what they reconstruct of what's happening here is this funny little drawing right here. <laughs> See this guy right here? That's it right there. So they think that those pedestal bases had big like four by fours in them and that um, there must have been some tent and that the city judge, along with the other judges, would sit right there and that's where the cases. That's where the cases would be brought, right there in the city gate. And there's a nice little bench where all the other judges could sit. And uh, it's not even the size of this gathering space right here, that inner gate area. It's about half the size of this room. And uh, that's what we're talking about here. That's where all this, this stuff would go down. Um, the main scene in the book of Ruth all takes place at the city gate. It's very similar, very similar kind of thing. Anyway, isn't that, inter isn't that interesting? And what's also cool, I could probably find pictures, but if you look, these uh, stones right here, uh, in, you can actually see where they've carved out the, the old uh, hinges for the doors, the hinges that the doors would swing on, too. Anyway, I love this stuff. Sure. 
Yeah, well, yeah, there you go, yeah. So in these, uh, oh yeah, so you can see the, the high place right there. If you go in, and then you can see, so that little throne thing is right behind this rock, and then there's a nice little uh, stone bench for all the other judges to sit on. And then people would all gather in there um, for the, the type of scene right here, where witnesses come forward, and the judges here, and they weigh, and so on. There you go. It's not a fairy tale. <laughs> 17, verse 8. Now, if some cases come before your courts and they're too difficult for you to judge, so this is on the local city community level, whether it's bloodshed, whether it's like murder or lawsuits or assault, take them to the place Yahweh your God will choose. Go to the priests who are Levites who are to judge, excuse me, go to the priests who are Levites and to the judge who is in office at that time. Inquire of them, and they will give you a verdict. So if your local judges, it's too difficult, you go to the central temple, and there are the priests who immerse themselves in Torah, at least ideally, and study the Torah. Uh, they'll, this, is, this is court of appeals, basically. It goes up. Verse 10, you must act according to the decisions they give you at the place Yahweh your God will choose. Be careful to do everything they direct you to. Act according to the law, or the Torah, that they teach you and the decisions they give you. Don't turn aside from what they tell you to the right or the left. The man who shows contempt for the judge or for the priest who stands ministering there before Yahweh your God must be put to death, purge the evil from Israel. All the people will hear and be afraid. No one will be contemptuous again. So there's a very strong concern um, that Israel be a community that's defined by loyalty to Yahweh who rescues them and then Sedek and Sedek alone. And so all of these structures are meant um, to, to protect that. So you have, uh, you've got judges local judges, then you've got priests. But then uh, Israel was eventually to uh, have kings. And if you think about it, so you have tribes, local cities and tribes and so on. That's all inner tribe stuff. You have priests. Priests are also one of the tribes. But then you have eventually kings who are over the whole system. And of course the temptation is because a king isn't locally rooted in any of these settings that this whole thing is going to get broken and power will be abused and so on. So the last paragraph we'll read this morning is um, the, <laughs> the only descriptions of what the king is supposed to do and be like. And these are, these are quite astounding. Let's just read them. This is such a great passage. Verse 14. So when you enter the land Yahweh your God's giving you and you've taken possession of it, and you've settled in it, and you say, hey, let's set a king over us like all the other nations around us. Be sure to appoint the king Yahweh your God chooses. The king Yahweh your God chooses. Think, think through the story of Israel with me. The king Yahweh your God chooses. Um, who's coming into your mind? <laughs> well, maybe no one's coming to your mind because it's early. So think of the story of David, right? And the, the story of how he gets chosen because he has all these brothers who are taller, better looking, all this kind of thing. And so the whole point is that Yahweh, it's this, this motif that runs right through uh, the Bible of Yahweh chooses the weak, the marginalized, the people you would never expect. He doesn't work according to the ways of power and influence that we think about things. So don't pick a king that you think is going to be the right person. Pick a king, Yahweh your God chooses. He must be from your own brothers. He needs to be an, an Israelite. Don't place a non-Israelite, a foreigner over you, one who's not a, a brother Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself. Or make the people return back to Egypt to get more of them. 
those Egyptian stallions, I'm telling you, right? For Yahweh has told you, yeah, don't go back that way. Horses, what are horses in the ancient world? <laughs> power, tanks, <laughs> they're tanks, they're ancient tanks. So here we're talking about power, military power. So the king, the Israelite king, like, mustn't build a huge military machine. Now think, for Israelites, why, who, who, is, who is their warrior and their hero and fights their cause? Well, not their cause, fights his cause, which Israel sometimes is on, mostly not. Um, but who is Yahweh's, you know, Yahweh, the whole point is that Yahweh fights Israel's battles for them. And it's not about their military power at all. It's about the, his grace. So, don't build up an army. And don't get Egyptian tanks, for sure. Verse 17. He must not take many wives. Or his heart will be led astray. So here we're talking about, specifically, wives connected to political alliances with other nations. Um, and... For other nations, that always means other gods. So it's, it's wives connected to, well, there you go. It's, it's about a compromise of the covenant people. So you've got power, and then now you've got sex. And then the last line, and he must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Money. Right? Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, as you could say, right? So power, sex, and money. It's the human problem is never really changes, does it? So this is a king who you don't build a huge military, you don't accumulate a huge centralized economy because the tribes are all have their land and they're going to be just fine, um, and you don't do a lot of political alliances and have a lot of wives. Well, what on earth is the king supposed to do then, right? That's just what kings do, right? So what is this king supposed to do, the Israelite king? Here's what he should do, verse 18. When he takes the throne of his kingdom... He is to write out for himself on a scroll a copy of this law, of this Torah, taken from that of the priests who are Levites. So he is to write out for himself his own personal copy of the scriptures, so to speak. And that scroll is to be with him. He is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere Yahweh his God and follow carefully all the words of this Torah and these decrees. So, so what is the king supposed to He's supposed to be a, a Bible scholar. <laughs> That's the Israelite king. He's supposed to immerse himself in the scriptures. And this is all in the context of creating an, a culture that pursues Tzedek and Tzedek alone. So you have the judges who judge Tzedek, you have the priests who immerse themselves in the Torah, and then you have a king who doesn't do what all of the other kings are doing. The role of this king is to be the leader of, of someone whose life models what it means to be immersed in the scriptures and to have a life shaped by the scriptures. And if that happens, look at verse 20, what will be the result in how this king leads the people? He will not consider himself better than his brothers. Can you think of any political leaders who come to think of themselves as better than other people, right? So it's like, we know this. this is, so the scriptures, apparently if the scriptures are having a real effect on someone's life, it just crushes pride in a big way, and especially of a king. So he won't consider himself better than his brothers. He won't turn from the Torah to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. And that is all the book of Deuteronomy has to say about kings. So like, what, what legislative powers do they have? What the power over, the, like it's just like, it just kind of eviscerates the whole office almost, at least the way we think of it. And it, he's basically to be a leader in studying the scriptures and whose life becomes a model to the people of what it means to, to fear and honor Yahweh. There's nothing else like this in the ancient Near East. Kings are gods in the ancient Near East. They can do whatever the heck they want, um, but not, not in Israel. This is really, this is really astounding. Um, and so what a good note to, to close on. 
for, for the week. Um, just this closing paragraph, a, a, your personal copy of the scriptures that this person immerses themselves in and the, the effect is that it produces someone who's humble. The scriptures humble you. <laughs> That's the basic effect, verse 20, that you don't think you're better than other people. Um, and if, if pride is an issue for me, it means the scriptures are not having the right effect. I'm not, I'm not hearing and listening. Uh, because when, when I do, I realize that like a king or anybody, I'm not in a position <laughs> to elevate myself above other people. I'm one of the covenant people who's been rescued by God's grace. And uh, my goal is to point other people in that same direction. So there you go. Let's, uh, that's Josh White's motorcycle. <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's close in a word of prayer and uh, just let that truth kind of shape us as we, uh, as we go into our day.